If you have your Bibles, open up to the book of Zechariah. I'm going to start a, uh, a new short series in the book of Zechariah, and I've labeled uh, this series Return. The book of Zechariah has everything to do with the message of returning. Uh, he tells us to return, whether it's return uh, to the land of God's promise, return to God's presence, re- the return of the Messiah, uh, the return of uh, God's fulfillment of his promise. The message of return is written throughout the book of, Ze- of Zechariah. Uh, many commentators have actually labeled it the revelation of the Old Testament. Uh, much of what you read is a vision. Uh, there is actually eight visions, and we're going to talk about all eight visions today. And then there are several messages uh, specifically that, uh, Ma- that Zechariah speaks. And Zechariah is a, is a messenger of encouragement. At the same time, there's some correction in the encouragement. How many of you know that it's good to bring some encouragement, but at the same time, uh, many of us, we need correction as we're being encouraged. Uh, it's, not, it's not enough to say, well... You're encouraging me to continue to do something, but it's the wrong thing that I'm doing. <laughs> How many of you ever have ever been there? Uh, some of us, we seek uh, affirmation from God uh, for what we're doing, and we never seek God's direction in what we're doing. Uh, we want God to say, uh, great job, good good going, but we never really want to say, hear his voice say, hey, you're, you need some course correction here. Because discipline and correction is not always so easily swallowed. It's not so easily taken. Zechariah brings some of that uh, as well in his message. So read along with me. Zechariah chapter, chapter 1, starting in verse 1. It's the eighth month in the second year of Darius. And the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Edo, uh, saying, The Lord was very angry with your fathers, therefore say to them, Thus declares the Lord of hosts, I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets cried out. Let's stop right there and look at what he's saying here. He says, God was very angry with your fathers, therefore say to them, Thus declares the Lord of hosts, return to me. And I will return to you. I, I, I like that idea. It's, it, this is the concept of God's promise to us. If we return to him, he returns to us. It's, it's clearly th- written throughout scripture. Jesus uh, reminds us that we're to seek and to knock. And, uh, and if we seek him out and we knock on the door, he's right there. He's been waiting for us. And so he says, if you return to me, I will return to you. It's an idea of repentance. This concept of repentance that's given throughout scripture is one that is foundational to each one of us as we walk the life that God desires us to walk. It's not just a one and done act. It is a constant reminder that we are to return to him so that he can return to us. If we turn from him, then he'll turn from us. So if we return, in other words, we come back to him, he has never left us nor has he forsaken us. The idea of repentance is that we acknowledge what we've done, that we acknowledge that we've sinned. It's that recognition of where we stand with God. The recognition that our sin has separated us from God. And so I must confess my sin to him. And he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sin. That's what God lays out in his word. And it's one that we must consistently work out and and live out every single day of the life. Can I tell you, repentance is not a one and done deal. It it is not something that you just said, I I, I went to the altar when I was seven years old and I gave my life to Jesus and I repented on that day and every day has been hunky-dory with God since. (laughs) In reality, we all deal with sin and we all deal with the sin nature. And so repentance is this, is this remembering, remembering that as we deal with sin, we repent of it, we turn away from it, and we give it to God, and we say, God, here I'm dealing with this. I desire you to come and, and 
Be the Lord of my life to give me the strength to be more than an overcomer through the blood of the Lamb and through the words of my testimony. And so this, this idea of returning to God is an important foundational idea that Zechariah emphasizes to us. He reminds us that we've got to return to God in order for God's blessing, for God's strength, for God's mercy to come and abide in our lives. So he says, verse 4, do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets cried out. Thus says the Lord of hosts, return from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they did not hear or pay attention to me, declares the the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes which I command to my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? Wow. He says, when I, when I sent my prophets to speak the words of encouragement, to speak a message uh, that would bring them back to me, they turned a deaf ear to it. And he said, the anger of the Lord was upon them. And, and it was so much so, if you remember what the context of these verses, all right, this is after 70 years that the nation of Israel was taken into captivity, first by the Babylonians, then the Persians conquered the Babylonians, and now they're in the the second year of Darius. This is when this is being written. What took place was that there was a a group of uh, vigilantes or, or people who were trying to rise up against the Persian Empire. But if you, if you know anything about history, the Persian Empire was one of the strongest empires to have lived. Tactically speaking, there was nothing like the uh, Persian Empires in that day. Later on, we'll see Greece uh, take on some of the tactical initiatives that the, that the Persians had uh, perfected to wind up conquering the Persians. But there was no force on the earth like the Persian Empire. And so they had come in and uh, Cyrus had, uh, had decreed, had allowed the, uh, the nation of Israel to come back into Jerusalem. And there was a group of people who had come back. And one of them was Zechariah's grandfather, Idu or Ido. And so he had come back and had set up uh, a, a committee to start working on the temple. And as they're working there, God is asking them to repent, to come and, and to bring the, you know, to bring the nation to repentance. Of course, they had turned their backs, and yet God still did something in their hearts. And so this is what he's saying here. Uh, look, at, look at what God, God is. I love God. He doesn't pressure you to do something that, he, that you don't want to do, but he will be consistent in his desire to show you his affection and his love. So he's persistent. Now, he doesn't impose himself on you. And that's something we need to recognize. God's not just going to impose his will on your life. You, you may wind up thinking, oh, you know, yeah, it's all going to work out for good. Well, yes and no. It'll work out if you allow him to work in you. If, if you're going to do what you're going to do, he's going to let you do what you're going to do. He's not going to impose himself on you. If you continue to make poor choices in your life, if you continue to sin, God is going to allow you to live in in that squalor of that sin until the moment that you recognize where you stand and you say, God, forgive me. Then he he calls you right back. He says, hey, I love you. It's like that that, that beautiful illustration that Jesus gave about the, the son who had squandered his inheritance, giving that picture of the father who who is standing at, in his, at, at the roof of his home, he sees a son from afar off and he welcomes the prodigal back home. And he says, welcome. And he puts on a robe over him and he reminds him that he is his son. He loves him so much. So God says, and where are your fathers? Where are they? My words and my statutes which I commanded the, perfect, the prophets, uh, verse 6, didn't they not overtake your father's So they repented and said, as the Lord of hosts proposed to deal with us for our ways and deeds, so he has dealt with us. So they recognized why they were where they were at. So then on the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Idu. And he saw this. 
Remember, there's eight visions that he sees here. This is the first vision that he sees. Behold, there was a man riding on a red horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees in the glen, and behind him were red sorrel and white horses. Then I said, what are these, my Lord? The angel who talked with me said to me, I will show you what they are. (laughs) I like that. That reminds us that, listen, when we don't understand, when we don't know what God is showing us or what, where God is directing us, many times we stand in awe of God's presence. And sometimes because we're in awe of God's presence, we stand dumbfounded intellectually, spiritually, emotionally. We are standing there saying, what is this? I don't know what this is. The, the problem for many of us is that when we get to that place, we allow our ignorance to shut off the message that God is trying to speak to us, and we wind up just doing what we normally do. We ignore the message, we ignore the vision, because I don't understand that. How many of you have ever done that? God is showing you something, God has spoken to you something, and and you're sitting there and you're contemplating, what is it that God may be, I don't understand this. And because you don't understand this, you wind up just doing what you normally do. Because it's easier for us to walk in our comfort and in our own knowledge, in our own wisdom, than to seek God's wisdom. But here, Zechariah is not content with just saying, wow, I, re- I, had, uh, I had a vision from the Lord. Wow, God really loves me. No, he's like, I have a vision from the Lord. God, what does it mean? When God speaks to us, we must ask God for clarification of what he is trying to say. We have got to seek the clarification of what God is trying to speak into our lives. You know, we can all receive a a word from the Lord. We could all have a specific uh, message that God speaks to our lives and, and we could be content with that message that was given to us saying, well, we received, uh, you know, there was a, a spiritual impartation in our lives. And that was wonderful experience. It was such a powerful experience. But unless we make some practical applications, that vision means nothing. I, I want you to understand that. We're not seeking just to have an experience. In your spiritual walk, you should never just seek to have an experience. There has got to be some action placed on the experience that you've received. God has spoken to us not so that we can stay comfortable where we stand, but that we can then use that experience as a launching pad for what he has for our lives. So Zechariah says, I don't know what this means. God, can you tell me what this means? I need clarification. So the angel talked with me and he said, this is verse 9, I will show you what they are. So the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered, These are they whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. And they answered the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees and said, We have patrolled the earth and behold the earth remains at rest, or in some of your versions, it may say at peace. Then the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have no mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which you have been angry these 70 years? So you see, they've been in captivity for 70 years. The angel of the Lord goes out and he's, he's riding on this horse, and, and he comes back and he reports to the, this is one of those, what we call uh, in biblical uh, interpretation or prophecy, we, we call this a Christophany, or an appearance of Jesus uh, in Old Testament scripture. The angel of the Lord that has appeared here is like the Son of God, it is Jesus, he's uh, a personification of Jesus in the Old Testament. And he reports to him, hey, all is at rest or all is at peace. Now that word in the, in, in the original uh, Hebrew is, is, is one that doesn't just connote 
peace or rest. It actually means that everybody is just happy doing what they're doing. They're content. And here's the problem with that. God has an issue with that. It's because he says, oh, how long will these people be continually suppressed? How, how God's wrath is involved in this. How is it involved in this? Well, look at what had actually happened. You understand the nation of Israel was in 70 years of captivity. In those 70 years, the nation, the Israelites, the Jews who had been taken into captivity had become very wealthy. They had uh, used their abilities to go into the marketplace and uh, many of them had grown very wealthy and comfortable living the life outside of God's purpose and God's will. And so they had accumulated much stature and much wealth in the nation of Babylon. And that translated when the Persians came in, the Persians used their creativity as well. And they continued to prosper. And yet God's house in Jerusalem lay waste. Zechariah's grandfather had come back on the word of, uh, of, of uh, Cyrus, had come back to the nation of Jerusalem, had come back to the city of Jerusalem, had had attempted to rebuild the temple. But the temple, in those 13 years, it was being built by volunteer workers. And they weren't doing very well. They hadn't got very far. And everybody was discouraged. And when people are discouraged, you're not effective. I believe God was speaking to me about Zechariah before this week, and uh, Nathan had asked me a few weeks ago. He said, you know, this is uh, the, the last series we were in, Jesus at the Table. He's like, wow, this is such a powerful series. You know, what, what, do you, what do you feel like God is speaking to you next? And, man, I was just, I was like, you know, Zechariah, just God keeps bringing back Zechariah. I don't know why. I just, you know, I was doing my study through Zechariah and, and, and getting all this stuff together, and, God was just impressing on our heart. And then, of course, we started dealing with the land, the 10 acres that we're looking at. And uh, God is bringing us to a place. It's a place of returning. You know, this, this idea of returning that's all throughout Zechariah is this idea that if we will return to him, he will return to us that which we have lost, and it will be even greater than what it was before we lost it. And so he says, he says to him, how long will you guys be comfortable where you're sitting while my house remains in shambles? And what he's actually talking about is that, that, that this nation had allowed this thing to take place and became comfortable accepting the status quo. And if there's something that we can't accept is that we are, we can't embrace the status quo of where we stand today. We've got to continually seek God for his direction. May he open our eyes to see. May he open our ears to hear where the spirit is leading us today. And I'm not just saying that as a church, and I do believe that as a corporate body, we have got to remember that we, we can't rest on the laurels of what we've done in the past. We have got to seek God for the future, but individually, we must seek out what God's purpose and plan is for our lives and not accept the status quo of where we stand today. He says, my heart is broken. My heart is broken because I see what, what is here and everybody is just at rest. How long will you have no mercy on Jerusalem? Verse 13, and the Lord answered gracious and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. Wow. It reminds him, hey, I'm right here. Never left you. Always been right by your side. Never forsaken you. I've always got you on my mind. I love you. Gracious and comforting words. So the angel who talked with me said, Cry out thus to the Lord of hosts. I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion. I am exceedingly angry for the, with the nations that are at ease 
For while I was angry, but a little, they furthered the disaster. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I will return. I have returned to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it. How many of us can declare that today? That bridge of life, God will build his church. Amen? declares the Lord of hosts, and the measuring line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. And I love this because he's preparing for the next, uh, another vision that he's about to give. He says, that measuring line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Cry out again, thus says the Lord of hosts. My city shall o- uh, once again overflow with prosperity, and the Lord will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. Now, now I don't want to just super spiritualize this to say that this is the church, but he's actually talking not just about this modern day grafted in body of the church. He's actually talking about the nation of Israel as well and the city of Jerusalem. And so there is a twofold promise here. One, that God will restore those who he loves. And he had a covenant promise with the nation of Israel. And it's something that we've seen come to pass. These are things that we are seeing for being fulfilled even today in the nation of Israel. And it is something that we can claim for us that that God is speaking to us today as children of of that promise as well. That he will build his church and that gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So he lifted his eyes, verse 18, and he said, he saw, and behold, there was another vision that he saw, four horns. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these? And he said to me, these are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen, and I said, what are these coming to do? And he said, these are the horns that scattered Judah, so that no one raised his head. And these have come to terrify them, to cast down the horns of the nations who lifted up their horns against the land of Judah to scatter it. Why would he send craftsmen? (laughs) Remember what he's doing. God is going to restore his temple. Who are the ones who build? The builders build. Craftsmen build. And he says that, once again, the, the, the place where God's presence figuratively dwelt, the temple, would once again stir up the nations. He said, I have sent the craftsmen to come to restore the city, to restore the temple. So he's giving this this encouragement that once again this temple will be built and that it would shake the nations once again. That God's presence would dwell with his people. Zechariah chapter 2. And so he lifted up his eyes again and he said, Behold, now here's the next one. A man with a measuring line in his hand. Then I said, Where are you going? He said to me to measure Jerusalem, to see what is its width and what is its length. And behold, the angel who talked with me came forward, and another angel came forward to meet me. And he said to him, Run, say to that young man, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as the villages without walls because of the multitudes of people and livestock in it, and I will be to her a wall of fire all around. Wow. I like how the uh, Message Bible puts this. Let me read this. I looked up and was surprised to see a man holding a tape measure in his hand. And I said, what are you up to? I'm on my way. I'm on my way. He said to survey Jerusalem, to measure its width and length. Just then that messenger angel on his way out met another angel. And he said, run and tell the surveyor, Jerusalem will burst its walls. Bursting with people, bursting with animals, and I'll be right there with her. (laughs) declares the Lord, a wall of fire around unwalled Jerusalem and a a radiant presence in it. You see the picture here? See, many of us, we want to put God in a box. What we need to understand is that God is not confined to four walls. 
whether it's the four walls of a church or whether it's the four walls of a meeting place, God is not confined to the four walls. As a matter of fact, God wants us to be a church without walls. Now, now remember just before he said that the, that the tabernacle, the temple, would be a shining light to the nations that would distress the nations who had taken the nation of Israel into captivity. But at the same time, it says that God is the walls. It wasn't just the, it wasn't the tabernacle that would be distressing them. It would be God's holy presence in that place. That God's presence would be like fire that, that would, it would be all around the city. All around its circumference. Now, do you remember the last time that happened? The nation of Israel was taken out of Egypt. And as they're going out of Egypt, Pharaoh's army comes against them, and God sends what? A pillar of fire. And that pillar of fire would guide them. It would become their their protection around them as they would go and see God, as as they would move in the direction that God had them. And so this was was once again that reaffirmation that God is the same God yesterday, today, and forevermore. And that he fulfills his promises. The promise that he gave to our forefathers is the same promise he gives to us. That he loves us. He cares for us. He desires relationship with us. And we've got to remember that. So as we look at this, he says, he he reminds them that he will be their walls. He will be their walls. His presence would be their walls. What do you build a wall for? Keep evil out, right? And keep us in, protected. How many of you went to bed last night? What was one of the things you did? You made sure you locked the door. You don't want somebody walking in into your house late at night. You hear a noise. First thing you do, get out of bed, you go by the front door. Well, yeah, you grab that too. (laughs) And then you check the doors. Those walls were meant to confine. But God says, my walls are not meant to confine. My walls are meant to be stretched. My desire for you is is not a limited desire. It's a limitless desire. It's limitless. So he says, up, up, flee from the land of the north, declares the Lord, for I have spread uh, you abroad as the four winds of the heavens, declares the Lord. Come out, escape to Zion. So now he's calling those people who were comfortable in those lands where they had made their wealth. He says, come back to my promise. Come back to the land of Zion. For thus says the Lord of hosts, after his glory sent me to the nations who plundered you. For he who touches you touches, listen to this. He who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Now we know that he's talking about his nation, but we also know that we are partakers of that promise. God calls you the apple of his eye. You know, that's, a, that's a love language term. That, that is like me looking at my wife and I think how sweet she is. How incredibly loving she is. And God says to us, you are the apple of my eye. That's what God thinks of you. Maybe some of us, our thinking is a little bit jaded of how God thinks of us. And maybe it's many of us, we, we have this perception that God does not think well of us. And we've got to change that. We've got to understand where we stand with the Lord, that God looks at us and he looks at us through that filter and that lens that says, even though you've hurt me, I still love you. Listen, my wife and I, there are times we argue. Once. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> We know people here who know better than that. And yet, the love I have for her transcends that argument. And the love that God has for us transcends what we may have done. We are still the apple of his eye. Behold, I will shake my hand over them, and they shall become plunder for those 
who serve them. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I come and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. Look at this. If you can't highlight some of this and embrace this message for yourself, listen, you've got to change your perspective. God believes in you. And many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day and shall be my people and I will dwell in their midst and you shall know the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And the Lord will inherit Judah. Be silent all flesh before the Lord for he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. Zechariah 3. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. This is where we live. This is where we stand every day. And so the the angel of the Lord is standing to oppose Satan. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now, Now I want you to interchange your name there. It says, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan, the Lord who has chosen Joanne, the Lord who has chosen John, the Lord who has chosen Drew, the Lord who has chosen you, has chosen Jerusalem, rebuke you, Satan. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Is not Joanne a brand plucked from the fire? Is not John a brand plucked from the fire? So not, now Joshua was standing before the angel and he was clothed with girt, dirty garments. We've all been there. We've all stood before the Lord clothed in dirty garments. And the angel of the Lord said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him, he said, behold, I have taken away your iniquity. And I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said to them, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and they clothed him with pure garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. Wow. Wow, what a picture of God's grace. What a picture of God's mercy. What a picture of how God restores us to right relationship with him. What was the turban? The turban that was put on his head was symbolic of his standing. Now he could stand with his head held high. And the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua. Who was Joshua again? Joshua was the high priest. So they put that clean turban and the angel of the Lord said solemnly to Joshua, thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts. And I will give you the right access among those who are standing here. Now, now this is important because this is the beginning of the messianic portion of this prophecy of how God uh, talks about the coming Messiah. The word, the name Joshua In Hebrew is the name Yeshua. The name Yeshua, as we went through this in past, uh, was corrupted into the English to Jesus. Actually, the French and then the English. So uh, Joshua is actually the name Jesus. And so he's he's giving a prophetic announcement here. So he's saying that Yeshua, Yeshua would put on these garments. And remember, he was a priest. But he says, you will rule. So now he's giving him authority as a ruler, one who would be like in the line of David. So so this is like the first portion of this messianic. And and, uh, Zechariah actually, besides Isaiah, the prophet who gives the second greatest amount of prophecies about the Messiah uh, outside of Isaiah. So Isaiah and then Zechariah give the most prophecies concerning the Messiah. So then he says, I will bring my servant the branch. And once again, that's the messianic portion of this prophecy. For behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts. I will remove the iniquity of this land Look at this, in a single day. Once again, 
another messianic prophecy. On the cornerstone, Jesus is our cornerstone. On one day, on the day that he died, the day that he gave his life, that he gave his life as a propitiation for our sins, our sins were removed on that single day. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. Wow. Chapter 4, verse 1, And the angel who walked with me came again and woke like a man who was awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, What do you see? I said, I see and behold a lampstand of gold and with a bowl on top of it, seven lamps on it and seven lips on each of the lamps that are on the top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right and one, uh, right of the bowl and the other on its left. And I said to the angel of the Lord who talked with me, What are these? Once again, don't make an assumption. God, what it, what is this? You know, it's easy for us to make assumptions. You know, we can look at uh, uh, some uh, things that maybe we feel like God is speaking to us through some, something, and, and we may uh, make an assumption without asking God, what does it mean? So he says, I, I need your direction here. What does this mean? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, do you not know what these are? No. I don't know what these are, he says. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, (laughs) nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Remember, in the Old Testament, the lampstands were a picture of the Holy Spirit's fire that consumed. And so he says, it's not by might, and it's not by power, but it's by his spirit, says the Lord. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel had laid a foundation in this house. His hand shall also complete it. Then you will know that the land of uh, the Lord of hosts who has sent me to you for Whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. It reminds us, don't despise the, 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 the small beginnings. Don't despise where God places you. You may not see it. You may think it's small and insignificant what God may be doing right now. But it's a greater purpose that he has for you in your life. So these are the seven eyes of the Lord, which range throughout the whole earth. Then I said to him, what are these two olive trees on the right and on the left? And a second time I answered and said to him, what are these two branches of of the olive trees, which are beside the two golden pipes from which the golden oil is poured out? And he said to me, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Now this it's future prophecy. This is, this is what would later be uh, talked about in the book of Revelation. Daniel also makes mention of this. So God is, God is giving him some pictures of, of some of the things that he's going to allow to come to pass. Some of it takes place immediately. Some of it takes place uh, eventually. And some of it will take place in his perfect time. God's timing is not our time. And I think we, we really miss out when we think that God uh, should do for us when we say God should do for us. We want to put time constraints on God. We want to say, God, you've got to do this now because if you don't do it now, then it will never get done. Really? You're talking about God. The reality is that God has a purpose and a plan and a time and his time is perfect always. And so when, when uh, Zechariah receives this vision, he's not quite sure what God is saying. He's confused about it. But he says, God, okay, I understand. I, I understand that I don't understand. <laughs> it's your plan and your purpose. So he sees a vision of a flying scroll. Verse chapter 5, I lifted my eyes and said, behold, a flying scroll. And he said to me, what do you see? I 
I answered, I see a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubits. Its width is 10 cubits. Then he said to me, this is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole land for everyone who steals shall be cleaned out according to what is on one side. Now, what is that scroll? That's the word of God. Now, what is he saying about the word of God? He's saying that the word of God is our standard of morality. This is what he's saying. The word of God is our standard of morality. And if you're, if you don't, if you don't live by the, by the word, then the word becomes a curse to you. For everyone who steals shall be cleaned out according to what is on one side. And everyone who swears falsely shall be cleaned out according to what is on the other side. I will send it out, declares the Lord of hosts, and I shall enter the house of the thief and the house of him who swears falsely by my name. And it shall remain in his house and consume it, both timber and stones. You don't want to mess with the word of God. It is our standard of morality. It is our code of ethics. It is his word. Then the angel who talked with me came forward and he said to me, lift your eyes and see that which is going out. And I said, what is that? And he says, "Uh, this is the basket that is going out. And he said, this is their iniquity in all the land. And behold, the leaden cover was lifted and there was a woman sitting in the basket. Now, uh, for those of you who who like the book of Revelation, like prophecy, uh, correlate this with what's in the book of revelation it said and this is wickedness verse 8 and he thrust her back into the basket and he thrust down the leaden weight on its opening and then i opened i lifted my eyes and saw and behold two women coming forward the wind was in their wings they had wings like wings of a stork they lifted up the basket between the earth and heaven then i said to the lord who talked with me what are they, where are they taking this basket? And he said to me, the land of Shinar to build a house for it. And when this is prepared, they shall set the basket therein. Do we know what this means? I just know that it correlates with what's in the book of Revelation. And in there, there's some, some prophecy that's given about the, the woman of wickedness. And, and some of that has to deal with the Antichrist and some of those things that will be talked about later on. I can't give you an immediate answer on all those things. A lot of these things are left to the the mysteries of God. And so we just receive it. And one day we'll have the enlightening of what God desires us to know about these things. When will all this be fulfilled? I don't know. No man knows the day or the hour. Right? Right? There have been people who tried to say, well, he'll come in 1988. 88 reasons why God will come in 1988. Remember that? Anybody here? (laughs) Y2K. Oh, man, Y2K. You watch. That's going to be when the resurrection takes place. Well, it's been 17 years since Y2K. What was that? 2012. Yeah, 2012 with the Mayan prophecy and whatnot. No man knows the day or the hours when these things will take place. But what we do have is what God desires from us, and that is that we return to him. And with this last vision, he reminds us that. He says again, verse six, uh, chapter 6, I lifted my eyes and saw, behold, four chariots came out of between the two heavens and the mountains, and the mountains were bronze. The first chariot had red horses, the second black horses, the third white horses, the fourth chariot dappled horses, all of them strong. And then I answered and said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said to me, these are going out into the four winds of heaven after presenting themselves before the Lord of all the earth. The chariots with the black horses towards the north country the white ones go after them the dapple ones go uh, towards the south country when the strong horses came out they were impatient to go and patrol the earth and he said go patrol the earth so they patrolled the earth and then he cried to me behold those who go towards the north country have set my spirit at rest in the north country those who are comfortable in the north country they've gotten comfortable up there I'm going to stir them up. I'm calling them to return. So God's message then to us is to return, to come back. He wants us to come to him. He wants us to come and dwell in his promise. And each of these eight visions has something of significance to us. 
They're visions that call us to the greatness of God. Some of them are not easy to understand. Some of them, we don't have the answers, but others are very practical and applicable to our lives today. And we must seek God for his word and for his, and for his direction in our lives and be willing to say, God, it's not my will, it's yours that needs to be done. God, I need you. I don't want to be uh, content where I stay. Stretch out my borders. Let me know how far you want me to go and take me to the, take me as far as you need me to go. Let me be willing today. As you lay out that measuring rod, (laughs) stretch me. Stretch me. You close your eyes, bow your heads. Heavenly Father, I thank you that when we don't know what things mean in the Bible, that we can come to you and ask, God, give me direction. God, what are these things? Speak to me. May I hear your voice. I thank you that Zechariah, when he didn't understand, he was was bold enough to say, God, I don't know what you mean by this. What does this mean? Father, in my own life, there have been times where you've spoken to me and I, I stood in awe and wonder at your presence and yet I neglected the message because I didn't know what it meant. And I ask, Father, that when you do show up, may I have the sense enough to be able to say, God, not my will, yours be done. Speak to me. Reveal to me your mysteries. To him who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. Many of you are in a place of decision in your life. There's some rebuilding that is going on. Whether it's in your career, whether it's with your family. We know we have some here at the church. We've got some rebuilding. We're going to be building a new building. Amen. God, we trust you in this process. We trust you that we can acquire that land at a great price. We trust you that we can, that we can start construction the moment that we get title to that land. We trust you for the provision, knowing that it is your will and your purpose. So give us ears to hear. Give us a sensitivity in our hearts to know when you speak to us. What you're saying. Is that you today? Some of you living in a land of confusion right now. You're saying, Pastor, I'd, I've got some decisions that I've got to make going forward. And I just, man, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. Just like what, you were, what, what was revealed here to Zacharias. There have been, I've seen a lot of things. And I don't know which step I need to take next. I don't know where I should be going. I don't know the next step in my life. And I need God to clearly show me what I need to do so that I can stretch myself in His purpose and His will. There's rebuilding going on in my life. Is that you today? God is rebuilding. I see that hand. I see that hand. Lord, for those who are seeking direction, I pray that you would open their eyes in their ears give clarity today I want to hear your voice and know that you're here with me I ask this in Jesus name